Team Scarlet beat Team Gray by a score of 34 to 26 as Ohio State's spring game concluded at around the 2:10 p.m. Eastern Time mark. This is a spring game, so this far from determines how the season is going to go. There are plenty of programs around the nation who will look great from their spring game and perform very poorly in the regular season. It's how things go sometimes. And of course, the offense and the defense, in this case, as this game was non-traditional, Team Scarlet was offense, Team Gray was defense, but these players are players of the same team. They're not going to go as hard as they can at each other and try and kill each other. That's not saying that they weren't playing hard. They certainly were playing hard, trying to make big plays, trying to get to the end zone, trying to make, trying to sack if you were the defense, trying to pressure the QB, but you're not going to be playing with that same intensity and anger against your fellow man compared to, let's say, rival Michigan or Penn State or Michigan State. And it's the same thing with the Michigan spring game and the Nebraska spring game. Spring games you have to take with a grain of salt. There are only deep concerns, really, that you can derive from a spring game if there's major injuries or if some play, whether it's a QB play or running back play or offensive line play, if a position group's play is far different from what you thought it was. And then maybe there's cause for concern. But there wasn't much of that today. And we're going to be talking about all Buckeye football today, just talking about the spring game. I'm going to start off by just talking about some stats, looking at some of the drives and scores and discussing those quarter by quarter. And then I'll move on into the takeaways, which will talk a little bit about how I think what I saw today can actually relate to the fall and to the regular season. So as I was saying before, this was not a traditional spring game, much like the Nebraska spring game that I covered this past weekend. This was an offense versus defense game. Team Scarlet was the offense, Team Gray was the defense, and it was actually a pretty close game, really. It was only an eight-point difference, I believe, at the end, and even though it started off looking like the offense might dominate, the defense got settled down, they made some nice sacks, they held C.J. Stroud to a 64 completion percentage and a 124.5 passer rating, which is better than a lot of teams did to him this past season. That obviously, to me, speaks that the defense all around is improving in coverage, which they were actually pretty good at last year. They're also improving in the realm of the run defense. They only allowed 3.6 average yards per rush. And yes, some of that was due to some of the two-hand touch that we saw that was mainly given to first stringers. You don't want to get your first stringers injured no matter what, or your quarterbacks. So that's why they weren't being, they weren't receiving that full contact treatment that other players, specifically backups, were. But still, only allowing Henderson, Evan Pryor, and Mayan Williams to rush for an average of 3.6 yards per carry. It also includes Saunders as well, and some backups, which affect the numbers. But still, Ohio State's rush defense, I think, showed some improvement. I think the offensive line, at moments, showed some improvement by opening up holes and pushing the def defensive line. But once again, that D-line is improving from last year, both in the pass rush and in the rush defense. It's still sort of difficult because, again, it's just a spring game. you got to take it with a grain of salt. The first score was a Jackson Smith and Jigba 29-yard pass from C.J. Stroud. It was an amazing play. He leaped into the end zone, somehow dodging that two-hand touch, quote-unquote, tackle that I thought he got, and they named it as a touchdown. And the next one was a Joe Royer pass from Kyle McCord, 24 yards to make it 14, I think, to three. They don't list the defensive scores here, but the defense scored, I think it was a point for a punt. It was two points for a sack. It would be, I think, six points for a pick six or a fumble recovery for six, including the point after attempt going to the defense 
and I forget how much a turnover was, whether whether it's a fumble or a pick, in which there was one turnover. It was an interception thrown by Devin Brown. I think that is three points, maybe four or five. Tell me down below if I got it wrong. I'm always open to comments that correct me. After the Joe Royer pass from Kyle McCord in the second quarter, you had a 22-yard rush by Evan Pryor, which really showed off his speed, his vision, mainly just the speed, honestly, just going around defenders and going straight to the end zone, a 22-yard rush. Jake Seibert then made a field goal in the second quarter, and then in the third quarter, our Scott Stocksdale don't know why I pronounced that, but whatever. R. Stocksdale had a 19-yard pass from Devin Brown, and after that you had a Garrison Smith 38-yard field goal. And that was the 34 points for Team Scarlet. Team Gray, for this stat sheet, it doesn't show how much they scored, but from what I remember, it was 26 points. They forced a turnover. They got six sacks. They had one QB hurry outside of those six sacks. Again, they only had one takeaway, which was a pick. They returned it for nine yards. They had 105 total tackles, 41 of, 61 of them solo, 10 tackles for loss, and they had 10 pass breakups. Again, that secondary looked really good. I was impressed with it all around. And then at halftime, we can't forget this. They had a memorial video for Dwayne Haskins, and I just have to say once again, I made a post for it, but it's sad. 24 years old, I think, was with Washington, with the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was going to contend for that starting quarterback position job in Pittsburgh against Mitchell Trubisky. And unfortunately, for reasons of which we are still un... we really don't know, but he was crossing a highway. It sounded like his car might have run out of gas and he was trying to get gas and he unfortunately got hit by a car. And it sucks. It's horrible. No 24-year-old man really deserves that. I mean, you don't expect 24-year-old men in the United States to to die. And his players, his coaches, Ryan Day, fellow players, Chris Alave, spoke on how he was a, he was a really great person, touched the hearts of many that he played with, and that he was coached by. Ryan Day was obviously emotional, same with the whole team, and C.J. Stroud as they were watching that memorial video. And no matter who you're a fan of, no matter who you cheer for, what you believe in, it, it's it's sad. It, it's, it's so sad just seeing what happened to him. And I just had to mention that because that was a big part of this game too, C.J. Stroud wearing... Dwayne Haskins' name on his jersey, number seven. It was it was a big deal, and they had a moment of silence before the game began, too. It was a big deal. I think they should retire his number personally, and I think that his death is going to be used to a certain degree as motivation, especially for a kid like C.J. Stroud. But most importantly, they they honored him. And I think it would be a great honor. It's the last thing I'm going to say before we get on to my next point. But I think it would be it would be a great thing to see his jersey retired because 50 touchdowns in one season, he he put that 2018 team that had a lot of struggles of its own, namely defensively, he put that team on his back and he got them to 13 and one, a win in the Rose Bowl, a big win over arch rival. Michigan, of which I am a fan of, and a Big Ten championship. So I think they should retire his jersey, no doubts about it. And now we move on to the analysis portion, of which I have six points that I think the spring game spoke to. And first and foremost was all three QBs, in my opinion, played great, and McCord looks much improved compared to this past year. You know, his past year in the games he did play in, you know, he struggled, He struggled, for example, against a team like Michigan State when he was playing in garbage time, which is not a compliment at all. And he had some other struggles. I have not looked over him to the greatest degree, but from what I could tell 
from what I've watched of him briefly this past season and in the spring game, he looks to have improved. Unlike Quinn Ewers, who was ranked ahead of him, and unlike Jack Miller, who was behind him, he is stuck with the program. He said that there was no doubt in his mind that he wouldn't that he wouldn't stay here. He, there wasn't even a thought in his mind that he would transfer away. And I think that's something good when it comes to Ohio State. A guy who wants to stay and learn is always going to he's always going to outdo, or at least for the most part, someone who's constantly looking for the next possible opportunity. Because more often than not, when you're at a program like Ohio State, learning on the bench, waiting, learning, and just getting gaining experience and being coached, being willing to be coached, to be motivated by the guy in front of you is going to get you further than just always looking at the next possible opportunity. Devin Brown looked good too. He's a true freshman, just came in. He was Ohio State's main he was guy. He was the only QB recruit of their 2022 recruiting class, which that cycle obviously just finished. He was 11 of 24 for 141 yards, a TD, and a pick. He completed 46% of his passes with a 100.6 passer rating. Again, that's not like eye-popping stats. It's not even really good. But for being a true freshman, for just getting here, being involved in Ohio State's system, and going up against an improved defense— the defense was pretty good in defending the pass this past season. It was just the front seven and rush defense that had some issues. And the pass defense is improving. The rush defense is improving. And I think he still did well. Kyle McCord was 14 of 20 for 129 yards, one touchdown. He completed 70% of his passes and had the highest passer rating of the game with a 140.7. He played well, along with C.J. Stroud, who went 14 of 22, 120 yards, a touchdown, completed 64% of his passes, he had a 124.5 passer rating. And some of those passes, he took two, maybe three deep shots, and I think one or two of them were dropped by wide receivers. He was fitting the ball in beautifully, just through the smallest of holes to where if it was just a degree off, it would be picked batted down or incomplete he's he's going to be nfl ready might be the first qb taken off the board in the 2023 nfl draft the running back room is deep as well specifically williams and Pryor. they looked good mayan williams had 15 attempts for 101 yards along of 36 for 6.7 yards a carry evan Pryor had nine attempts for 62 yards a touchdown which was on his long of 22 rushing yards on that one touchdown run and 6.9 yards per carry. So Evan Pryor and Trevion Henderson, he only had three attempts for 12 yards, four point yards a carry. Him and Henderson are the speedsters, and Mayan Williams is the hammer, as R.J. Young put it. And I think that is the perfect way of putting it. From what I could understand, Mayan Williams his 6.7 yards a carry, a lot of that was due to him just using his legs and just kept keep just kept digging through, digging through his tacklers and just finding ways to get more yards. And that's going to be important for Ohio State because when you have a hammer, when you have a bulldozer, like think of think of Hassan Haskins for Michigan. Think of what he was able to do. You, you gave the ball to him on a fourth and one or third and one. He was basically guaranteed to get it. That's important because when all else when all else is failing and it's third and short, having a hammer, a guy who can keep churning for more yards, is really important. And you have that in mind, Williams and Trevion Henderson and Evan Pryor. They're guys that you get them in open space and they're gone. They're in the end zone. There's nothing you can really do about it. And they're also guys who are really good at catching the ball too. Evan Pryor had four receptions for 44 yards, 11 yards per reception with a long of 35, and he caught 100% of passes that were targeted towards him. So the running back room, very deep. Again, Williams and Pryor looked good. Pryor should be more involved in the running back rotation this season for sure. So Pryor, 
Williams, and Henderson. The defense all around looks more fundamentally sound as well. They're tackling better. Again, the defensive line got six sacks, which I think this past season, the defensive line this past season was not nearly as impressive as other Larry Johnson defensive lines. It just wasn't. But in this spring game, getting six sacks, an additional QB hurry, getting 10 tackles for loss, and you can credit that to the entire defense too. The secondary looked better. The linebackers made some plays and were good in coverage. And honestly, just the entire defense looks to be trending in the right direction. And if you're an Ohio State fan, that should excite you. If you're a Michigan fan like me or just a fan of any other Big Ten school or a school on Ohio State schedule, like let's say Notre Dame, that does not excite you at all. The defense looked good. 10 pass breakups as well. And that leads into the secondary doing an excellent job in coverage. There were moments where Stroud, Brown, McCord were all trying to fit it in, and they made nice passes, but the secondary did even better in coverage and sometimes had perfect coverage. You have guys like Ronnie Hickman, Denzel Burke, others, Cameron Brown. That's another name that just popped into my head. All those guys, they're great in coverage. They're good. And they are continuing to improve, especially with the upgraded defensive staff overall. So the defense is trending in the right direction. I think in the fall, you will see it. Do I think it's going to be top 10, top 5, even top 15? I don't know. It's going to be hard to make such a big leap from a really inefficient and below average offense to a great defense, not offense, but defense in a year. It's certainly going to be hard, but it's possible, and I think as long as this defensive unit is top 25, as long as they make clutch plays and at least improve in fundamentals with the offensive strength, eliteness, and depth that Ohio State possesses, you just need a top 25 or just an above average to good defense to win a national title, in my own opinion. The defensive line and offensive line were ying and yang. They were opposing forces that worked in harmony, and they complemented each other very well. There were moments where the offensive line dominated, were able to open up gaps to where Evan Pryor, Trevion Henderson, or Mayan Williams were able to run through or slither through, whichever word you think fits, whichever back more appropriately. And there were also times where the defensive line really penetrated through, got some tackles for loss, got some sacks, whether it was going around and blowing past the tackles or just penetrating on the interior and taking out that run. The defensive line and offensive line, they are, I'd say pretty well balanced is the safe word to use. And I think with the amount of talent, with the amount of five-star talent and the amount of development upgraded coaching that will impact both of these lines in a positive way, these lines are going to be tough to move if you're a team not named Ohio State or if you're a team that does not have great to elite front seven or offensive line, depending on what line you're going up against. It's going to be very hard to challenge Ohio State in the trenches. It's just what I'm trying to say. It's the simplest way to put it. And as always, the offense looked fluid and ready to attack. Absolutely. The run game was pretty successful all around, and the defense had its moments where it did a good job stopping it, and 3.6 yards allowed per carry is overall pretty good when it comes to the defense, but that's still enough to give you wiggle room on offense. A lot of that, again, was affected by Saunders going for 2.9 yards a carry, and he is deep back within the depth chart not even close to being a starter. And the run game looked good. It had its moments, obviously, the long 36 by Mayan Williams, the 22-yard touchdown rush by Evan Pryor was great. C.J. Stroud, he looked good. Kyle McCord looked good. Jackson Smith and Jigba, last year he might have been the best wide receiver for Ohio State, including a room that had Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson. Now he's the leader of that wide receiver room, he had two receptions for 38 yards and a TD. You now have Emeka Egbuka. You have 
Marvin Harrison Jr., you have G. Scott Jr., you have several different receivers that can do that can just do significant damage and have significant impact. And that combined with likely some improvements in the offensive line, improved depth in the defensive line now that Evan Pryor is healthier and obviously is a good running back and just continued improvements all around the offense, it's going to be a deadly offense again. I think it's going to be the number one offense in the land once again. And that's all I have to say for this video. That's all I could take away from the spring game. This Ohio State team, in my opinion, is still, I still have to watch the Alabama and Georgia spring games, but this Ohio State team is still, in my opinion, the number one team in the nation, and if they aren't, they are a team who is totally a playoff-level team, in my opinion. That's all I have to say for this video. If you liked it, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, click that notification bell, and comment your thoughts on the spring game down below. Who was your favorite player? What player do you think is going to have a breakout year in the fall who did have an impact or was shown in the spring game? Tell me down below, tell me your thoughts, and I will likely reply to your comments. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys around. Bye.